My name is Steve Webb, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Global Institute for Food Security, or GIFS, at the University of Saskatchewan. A bit of background on GIFS, we're a public-private partnership that was established in 2012 between Nutrien, the province of Saskatchewan, and the university. And our mission is to work with partners to discover, develop, and deliver innovative solutions for the production of globally sustainable food. And we serve as agriculture's and foods innovation catalyst, connecting throughout the ecosystem from the lab bench all the way to the consumer. We advance innovation by helping bridge the gap to commercialization to deliver resilient and sustainable food security for all stakeholders here in Canada and around the world. The inspiration for this series uh, was through a conversation with Dr. Angela Bernard Hahn, the Dean of USAS College of Ag and Bio Resources. And she asked, she asked me if I would give a seminar to the, to the community to share what is engineering biology. And what we uh, decided to do was to host an event where we can bring experts from Canada and the United States who can speak to specific examples and applications of engineering biology across various fields. And again, it's always better to hear from true experts like the like our previous edition where we had Dr. Jordan Thompson, Associate VP for uh, Strategic Partnerships at Ontario Genomics. And Jordan provided an overview of the Canadian Engineering Biology Roadmap, highlighting three priority areas for Canada to take advantage of this immense opportunity. And his video and presentation are available along with the others on the event page and on the GIFS YouTube channel, if you didn't get a chance to see it. And today, we're privileged to have Dr. Vincent Martin, who is also a, um, a partner, co-conspirator, if you will, in Canada's National Engineering Biology Steering Committee. He's professor and senior research chair at Concordia University and, you know, a the leading pioneer, the leading establishing Canada's really first foundry, if you will. And I, and he's gonna to talk to us today about drugs from bugs. And I know there's some folks online that are very interested in, bio, in, in biodiversity and how to mobilize uh, genetic resources to enhance both ag, food, health, et cetera. So I'm gonna hand it over to Vincent because we, want to hear from the experts and Vincent is an expert. So Vincent, take it away. Thank you very much, Stephen. So let's see if I can get this uh, sharing screen going without too much trouble. All right, everyone can see that? Yes. Perfect, uh, a little disappear eventually. So I, I wanna start off by thanking uh, uh, Steve for inviting me to give this, this talk. Uh, it's 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 an honor to do this, and, and hopefully I'll uh, introduce this audience uh, to the foundry and what we do with the foundry and some some projects. As I mentioned before, we went, on, went online. It's going to be a bit of a dog's breakfast, but I want to touch a little bit of different subjects. So so hopefully you'll be able to follow me along. There's still a thread with, within within the talk, but it bounces around quite a bit. Um, <clears throat> so I added to the, my to my title of drugs from bugs. Bioengineering systems for production of drugs and living therapies. So it's it's a little bit more than drugs from bugs, uh, but basically that's that's what my laboratory does. On top of developing a lot of technologies and, and establishing uh, um, uh, really um, centers and, and automation systems to really speed up uh, the bioengineering process. But back to oops, back to the topic. So. Uh, as you may know, plants have provided a rich source of bioactive natural products. If you look into our medicine cabinet today, and 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 also in the in the what's not available to us, but what's what's available as 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 pretty potent drugs, you'll find that a lot of these molecules um, either come directly from plants, or their structures uh, and and activities are inspired from plant natural products. So there be, can be semi-synthetics or derivatives of, of these natural products. Now I'm given here uh, four examples that I hope are, are pretty obvious to everyone of drugs that are commonly used today, very commonly used today, that come from, from plants. So aspirin, 
came from willow bark. We all know morphine coming from, from opium poppy. Uh, vincristine, uh, a potent anti-cancer drug coming from the Madagascar uh, periwinkle, and of course, taxol coming from the bark of the Pacific yew. So this is fairly well established, established fact. Now, if we look, can, can everyone see the panel on top of my, uh, of my screen, or is it in the way? I see this panel on top. It seems to be blocking some text. Um, so even though a lot of these molecules are, are well established in our, in, our, in our collection of drugs that we can use, if you actually look uh, in the past 20 years or so, since the, the, uh, the 1990s, you can see that pharmaceutical research has really reduced the contribution of natural products in our, in our programs, our R&D programs. And they're, they're really the current perception is, is multiple fold. Um, and I have them listed here. So the discovery and development of natural products is a slow process. That is not much you can do, change about that. But a lot of the other arguments that follow are, are can be solved by, by, by technologies that we have today. Um, an example is all of the natu uh, easy natural product uh, drug discoveries have been made. But so far, we've really only uh, kind of looked at about 10% of the plant diversity. And even within that diversity, we've only scratched the surface because some plants produce a lot of molecules that are in very small quantities and difficult to isolate. And another argument, another perception is the synthesis of natural products is too difficult and the stitch structures are too complex. Well, I, there's a simple one here, just use enzymes and enzymes and, and putting cascades of enzymes in metabolic pathways will allow you to access very complicated structures. Resupply is difficult and in my earlier days of this field, this was, this was a big motivation where if you look, and we're talking about plants here, but you can, if you look, let's say, in marine environments, you can find very strange marine organisms that have very potent um, anti-cancer and all sorts of other uh, small molecules, but they produce such small amounts that the, the, the pharmaceutical companies never really pursued them. So we thought if we could just find a way to make these molecules in a recombinant systems, we could potentially push them into the drug discovery and, and development pipeline. So engineering alternative biological supply systems is really what we're talking about here. And the last one is common chemistry is, is better than natural products. And over the years, that's actually, people have realized that that's not always true, mostly because natural products have evolved to be bioactive to begin with. So it's a really good place to start uh, as opposed to starting from scratch. Uh, and the structures that you see, and if you spend any time looking at some of these molecules, uh, the, the structure is so diverse and so complex that uh, a chemist's imagination really can't barely touch the, the, the structure of some of these molecules. So taken together, that really brings, uh, in my opinion, brings the, 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 the use of natural products back on the table and as, as a source of, of uh, drug development um, that we don't have currently. But there's another argument which was really interesting. During, during the pandemic, we heard this many, many times. I pulled this out of a newspaper clipping in, in La Presse, it's a French newspaper in, in Quebec. Uh, and it was an opinion piece that was published by David Goodman, who's the president and the CEO of Pharma Science. Pharma Science is the second biggest generic uh, pharmaceutical company in, in Canada. And uh, he was talking about uh, 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 asking Canadians and Quebecers to buy uh, drugs made in Canada as a means of having a, a better and more secure supply. Um, and I have a couple of quotes here. So in, in, his, in his piece, he said some. He said, in a key area like the production of medicines, it would not only be, have economic benefits, but could also solve serious supply problems facing our health system. And the supply problem here is an important and interesting one. <clears throat> and it, and it kind of, uh, David kind of laid out his argument this way. Uh, generics account for 75% of the prescriptions filled in Canada, but with the constant pressure uh, on, on uh, prices for, for generic drugs, they've fallen by about 60% in the last 10 years. So that's really that's what's what's happened. And I actually had a conversation with David once is that uh, these companies are actually forced to go and find supplies, whether raw products, uh, active active pharmaceutical ingredients or, or other ingredients for their for their for the manufacturing of their of their drugs. They have to go to countries that are much more cost competitive and very often end up in, in China and India. Um, and you can see uh, as the pandemic was evolving that supply chain issues, if you're actually getting your APIs and, and some of your raw products from these countries, it's going to be problematic. Now, in this piece, uh, David 
uh, uh, brought up two potential solutions uh, to the problem. One is stimulating local production and capacity, which I fully support. And the second was with creating a reserve of raw material and finished products, which could work. Uh, but a lot of these products have a limited shelf life. Uh, and how big, how big does that stock have to be for you to be able to, to survive a two or three year pandemic if you had to do that? So I'm not sure the second one I would support, but the first point I think, I think is a good one. <clears throat> now, the other one that keeps popping up more and more now uh, as, as uh, Elon tries to make his way to Mars is uh, on-demand on production systems. Um, and there's a lot of talk uh, on, you know, as we start exploring uh, deep space, uh, what are we going to do for medicine if people are gone months and years at a time? So right now on a, on a space station, they have a collection of 100, 200 different drugs that they keep in supply, and there's enough uh, shuttles going back and forth that they can keep supplying you know, their, their medicine cabinet. But in deep space uh, exploration, that's not going to be a possibility. Some have mentioned that plants would be good for astronauts to produce their medicines in space, but I think we have a better solution, and, and I'll describe that in the, in the coming minutes. But there's also the 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 um, the opinion that's that if you produce alternative production systems or on-demand production systems, I think it's going to democratize uh, drug manufacturing uh, and probably going to make the supply across uh, our different geographies in the world uh, more uh, equal. I would say so. There's another argument for that as well. <clears throat> so instead of using plants, this is my this is my argument. And this is what we work on in the lab. And if I've worked on for many, many years is why not use my microbes instead of plants. And there's one example here that hopefully some some of you recognize. So this is the plant Artemisia anya. This is how my entire foray into the space started back in the in the 1990s um, with the Gates Foundation and trying to develop a, a, a fermentation process to make a molecule called artemisinin, which is a which is an antimalarial molecule. But I have three other examples here. This is one that's really hot these days. So making cannabinoids. <clears throat> or, or making um, analgesics or opioids or alkaloids uh, using the same system. And the process generally is very simple uh, in, in principle. You identify what the genes are that make these molecules in the plant. You move these genes into, I have a picture here of a, of a baker's yeast. That's her favorite organism to, to, to engineer. You grow this, this engineer microbe into a fermenter, just like you would for, for beer and then and, and, Ostensibly, if you did your job right, this yeast is going to produce the molecule of interest um, uh, or the molecule that you're after. So this is really, uh, this would solve a lot of the issues that I talked about before. So if you're, for, in this case, if we, in Canada, if we want to, if we want to produce analgesics, so pharma science want to produce analgesics, their API or active pharmaceutical ingredients come from India and, and, and places like that, we could simply grow our yeast and, and produce all of the all of the pharmaceutical molecules we wanted to do or to produce. <clears throat> but there are challenges. And this is really a backbone or the basis of my, the rest of my talk. Um, and, and, and a lot of what we do in the lab is to try to address these challenges. And these are challenges in complexity of the molecule, diversity, the speed and the scale at which we can do this. Um, <clears throat> so what, I mean, what do I mean by complexity? So in, in terms of complexity, I talk about biosynthetic accessibility. So as you produce more and more complex structures and molecules, and you have to have more genes and engineer the, the organism farther and farther and deeper and deeper, what's the limit uh, that, that, or is there a limit that you're going to reach at one point? Uh, diversity is another, uh, and that's another uh, um, interesting problem um, that we have. So very often we can recreate structures um, that we identify from, from, from plants uh, by simply moving these enzymes and these pathways in the microbes. But we may be interested to use the same processes and system to make new to nature molecules or, or as a kind of a drug discovery um, pipeline. But how hard is that to do and how far can we diversify these molecules is a question that's, that we're, we're trying to work, work on and trying to address right now. Speed and scale are really important. So, so <clears throat> um, the, if you're going after a molecule that has a high value, you can spend a lot of time developing your bioprocess and spend a lot of time on R&D because you'll likely make your money back at the back end. But as your molecule has lower value, uh, your, your cost of development has to be lower. So you really need to speed 
how fast, uh, speed up how fast you actually develop uh, your organism to do this. <clears throat> so the question is, can we improve the design build test cycle of natural product biosynthesis of microbes? The example I have here is artemisinin, which I, which I spoke about in the previous slide, took about 10 years to, to get it up to scale. We can't do this for every molecule. So we have to come, come up with methods and ways to speed things up. <clears throat> and the last one is scale. And this is the one that's been a bit of an irritant to me in the, in the last few years. You see more and more examples of people uh, developing these processes and these, these strains and they produce micrograms per liter and they publish their papers. And we'll, we'll never know if they can scale these things. Some of these molecules are really interesting, but there's really, in reality, only one example of where there was, this was scaled to grams per liter and, and commercialized. And this was on the artemisinin project. So it'd be interesting to see how many, it, how many and can we scale any processes that would develop to the grams per liter and, and, and commercialize that. <clears throat> so here's complexity. I just wanted to <clears throat> address that in one slide. Uh, number of genes. So there's some pretty complex structures in, in the alkaloid space, noscopene and scopolamine and thebane. So this is the precursor to, a, to a morphine. <clears throat> if you actually look at these pathways and you look how they were engineered, something like 12 to 21 genes uh, were added, and these were mostly plant and, and bacterial genes, and some regulatory and biosynthetic proteins from the yeast were modified. So there's one example here. Looking at the terpene space, the artemisinic acid or, or the artemisinin project was 14 genes, six from plants, and a whole series of disruptions of, of yeast regulatory and, and biosynthetic proteins. So 1421. Here's an example that we haven't been able to reach yet. So the, the taxol, uh, about 18 plant genes, but a lot of cytochrome P450s. Uh, there's still some missing steps that we don't know about in the biosynthesis, but people have been trying to reconstitute this pathway in microbes for quite a long time now, and I've yet to see this happen um, in, in a recombinant system. And another example here, which is all over the news these days, is, is polyketides or mis this example here, uh, cannabinoid synthesis in using yeast or microbes, and that's about 16 genes coming from different places. Uh, that was published by, by uh, Jay Kiesling a few years back. So as you can see, by the time we hit somewhere between 14 and, and 21 genes and a bunch of background modifications, this is so far uh, the maximum we've been able to do. And it seems like if you hit more complexity and more steps, uh, it becomes more problematic to do that in the, in the microbial system. I'm not saying that we've reached the end of the road, but, but uh, that's kind of gives us an idea as to how, how complex in terms of biosynthetic pathways we can, we can do today in, in these microbial systems. In terms of diversity, um, so how do we reach diversity in mo of molecules uh, in, in this recombinant system? So I'm just giving you this example here of uh, uh, how you would do this. So a yeast would start with a substrate, usually a simple sugar, glucose, it can actually generate a different a, a diversity of precursors. It can uh, build different scaffolds with these precursors, and it can diversify the scaffolds to a certain extent. And that gives you a diversity of product. Let me give you specific examples. <clears throat> In the alkaloid synthesis, um, the yeast starts with tyrosine, which is mixed naturally. And then you need to produce an aldehyde that I show here and an amine. And there's one step that's called a narcoclerin synthase. Don't worry too much about the detail that produces what we call here the scaffold of this backbone from this amine and this aldehyde. So this is the first step in making, in, in making opioids or morphine. So if you want to diversify, uh, uh, let's say, uh, the, the scaffold structure, you can change the precursor, and we've done this, where instead of providing tyrosine, you provide phenylalanine, uh, tryptophan, or leucine, and you can get a different structural backbone. So that would be one example of how you do this. And on a scaffold, again, you, following the same pattern here. So here's your, your uh, norcoctorine that you start off with here. You end up with a mo molecule called reticulin. And depending on how you fold, I'll call it folded, or rearrange this reticulin molecule, you can get all of this diversity in terms of structure. And then you can imagine additional enzymes, P450s, methyltransferases, whatever, that'll diversify each of these molecules further. So this is how we reach diversity. But the problem obviously is, um, when you start doing what we call combinatorial biochemistry, uh, will every enzyme work with every substrate that we give it? Sometimes it does, they're quite promiscuous, and sometimes it doesn't. So we're still pushing the limits to see how much we can create new to nature or, or unnatural or, or maybe rarely seen molecules. Maybe they are natural, we just don't see them and we don't know they're there. 
So let's talk about speed. Um, so in the, in the 90s and, 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 and before next gen sequencing showed up, everyone's energy was spent in this space here. We were all trying to identify what are the genes and enzymes that are actually synthesizing these things. With next gen sequencing, and there's been some nice examples too of even uh, machine learning or, or AI to actually go into these really complex transcriptome and pull out the right sequences. I wouldn't say this is a completely solved problem because there's still new chemistries and new enzyme reactions, but the process has really accelerated. And you see, we see scientific publications come out now where they publish entire pathways in one paper, whereas historically it was one gene, one enzyme per year or whatever. So now it's it's bang, it's really, really fast. So I would I would say that's probably no longer a limiting uh, step um, as we do this, but there's, I don't want to take away the fact that this is still not a completely solved problem. Expression in recombinant hosts, this is what everyone's been trying to do in the last 15 years or so. You basically take all of these enzymes and you write the DNA, right? So we don't, we don't do cDNAs anymore, which is nice, but that's actually not so long ago, right? With gene synthesis, that's in the last 10 years or so. So here you get digital sequences and you make digital DNA. So you write the DNA uh, and then you assemble those. There's still some, some lab work that needs to be done to assemble these pathways. And then you look for activity. Um, this, I would say, is really no longer limited. We can, we can assemble pathways. And I asked, I'm asked to peer review these papers all the time of people that threw five enzymes, 10 enzymes together and they make a peak. They see a peak, they see activities, they reconstitute the pathway. So that's mostly not limiting uh, right now. Um, what the problem is, is here. It's optimization. Right? We can all make micrograms or milligrams per liter, but we really need to optimize this to make grams per liter if we can scale this. And then you get into a host optimization problem or a pathway optimization problem where you have to, to engineer the host for transport tolerance of the product, synthesis of the precursor. On the pathway optimization, you'll be playing around with promoter and terminator strength variants of your genes so you can get homologs you can engineer proteins et cetera, et cetera, copy numbers and you go through this over and over and over again i'll give you a few examples in a minute until you get that gram per liter scale that you want whoops and then you need to scale and this again is not a trivial uh, thing it's rarely done if ever in 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 academia and even industry this is just the uh, we're just really at the beginning of, of of this kind of thing we have scaled synthesis of natural products before but always with natural hosts. I mean, antibiotics is a very good example, um, actinomyces, et cetera, et cetera. But for recombinant engineered systems for, for, for these kinds of molecules, not too many examples. So scale is another one. I just mentioned this. Most of us work here. <laughs> Some of us, there's a few academic labs, not too many across Canada have small, small tanks for fermentation at the bench. The minute you need to make a few grams or you need to demonstrate scale, you're going to contract research organization or CMOs. And in Canada, we have very few. Uh, I, th I think I can probably count them on half of one hand um, that do this. Is, and, and believe it or not, this is this is quickly becoming uh, a limiting factor as more and more molecules and, and products and processes are coming up this pipeline. <clears throat> and again, I want to mention that the fact that the one that did do this is the semi-synthetic artemisinin project from Sanofi. There's a picture of their of their plant. They're no longer using this process, I believe. This is a photocatalytic reactor that they use to convert uh, artemisinin acid to artemisinin. Uh, but they reached in 2013 20 metric tons, and they were selling that for about $400 a kilogram. So again, there's an example of scaling, but not too many of them. Just a uh, just a pitch for our facility. So we're actually in the process of developing a, a bioprocessing center. So we have um, small to medium scale fermenters. And we have a couple of bigger ones. So at the back here, you can see a 150 liter um, steam in place tank. And behind this column, there's another one that's about 15 uh, liter steam in place. And we're actually looking to expand and grow on these facilities. So this is a this is this is where we're slowly going. We're trying to fill that gap of process development at the bench scale and and moving it up to a to a, to a larger scale. I want to give you a few examples because I keep kind of being this very generic about this and I. How many minutes am I, am I into this? I've, my clock says 26 minutes, but I think I started early. You can keep going. This is cool. <laughs> okay, I'll keep going. Just wave me, wave me to a stop, you know, when I, need, when I reach this point. So, so I just want to give an example of, of some projects that we work, uh, work on in the lab and give you kind of an idea as to the, the scale of the engineering problem and how, how we can solve this. 
So we work a lot with these uh, alkaloids, and we call them tetrahydroisoquinoline uh, alkaloids. And I'm just giving examples here of natural, semi-synthetic, uh, uh, and synthetic THIQ or tetrahydroisoquinoline derived drugs. Uh, but the most important part here is that is that moiety in the middle here, and it's a very favored uh, molecule in the pharmaceutical industry. If you actually look in the drug development pipeline, isoquinoline and, and tetrahydroisoquinoline are actually structures you find pretty frequently, and it's reflected here in some of the some of the molecules that are actually uh, in, in the pipeline are actually used as, as drugs right now. So we're very much interested in, in and working in this space and building existing and new molecules around the THIQ space. So how are THIQ produced? And again, this is an, I'm trying to give an example of the, of the diversity and the scale and everything else that I've mentioned before with a specific class of molecule here. So uh, uh, norcochlorine, which is uh, the precursor to eventually get to reticulin and, 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 and other alkaloids, <clears throat> is synthesized starting from tyrosine, and you get a hydroxylation and decarboxylation that gives you the amine. In the tyrosine, you get a deaminase that gives you a, 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 a pyruvate, 4-hydroxyphenyl pyruvate, to eventually the aldehyde, and this condenses to the norcochlorine. So if, when you're looking at this, this is the first engineering part that you have to do. So you have to turn tyrosine into dopamine, which is not natural in Saccharomyces, and make a lot of this aldehyde to move your process forward. So. I don't want to go into the nuts and bolts of the, the entire process and how we engineer this. I just wanted to give you kind of a broad set of examples. So we did this and, and published this work. And in this work, we whoops, in this work we demonstrated that we can get uh, lots and lots of dopamine, 23, uh, 24 milligrams per liter of dopamine, but we could only reach uh, low levels of narcoclerine in particular. So obviously there was a problem in, in how the pathway intermediates were balanced and how efficient the, 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 the pathway was to go from, from the tyrosine all the way down to the reticulin. Now, I'm only showing you this because it's it relates to the design, build, test cycle, right? So we're not gonna go into all the details, but each every time you see a little plus going down this row here, that's a design, build, test for, for a particular strain. So, whoops, sorry, my mouse is very sensitive. So. You start off with just making dopamine, and as you start engineering these things, and what I have circled here in red is actually gene knockout. So everyone thinks always in terms of gene expression. I have to put plant genes into this thing to make the molecule. But one of the problems we were having is this aldehyde is not very stable in Saccharomyces. So when I was talking about engineering the host before, you need to engineer the host to make your precursor that might not be something your microbe wants to do. So in this case, it's an aldehyde, and we had to knock out a whole bunch of things which are basically redox enzymes that they're detoxifying enzymes, most likely in yeast, uh, aldehydes is something they don't like. So, so we're knocking out enzymes that detoxify aldehydes in yeast in order to make this molecule. And I must admit that the yeast strain is limping a little bit by the time we, we reach the end of this process. Uh, and a lot of these other things are either overexpressing different variants of different genes, uh, cutting off internal sequences, changing promoters, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of this going on, but you basically go from uh, nothing or fumes all the way up to milligrams per liter, in this case of norcochlorin. So this in itself is quite an intense design built test cycle. And if you go farther, so this up here only stops at norcochlorin. If you want to take it to reticulin and eventually to, to thebane and morphine, you got to go farther down the pathway. And here's a whole new sets of DBTL uh, going simply from norcochlorin to reticulin. Um, so if you put it all together, you're talking about uh, hundreds of different strain variations and combinations and permutations with many, many years um, uh, in the lab. This was all done by a, post, a postdoc, a grad student, two postdocs and a grad student over probably a four year period to reach to that stage. But here in this case, we actually did put it in a fermenter, a pulse feed sucrose fermenter, and we did get the grams per liter. So we're very, very close here to, to a, a, a production scale for reticulin anyways, where it's it's commercial. The, 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 the numbers that are bouncing around is five to 10 grams per liter, if you do the, the, the economic analysis on this. Uh, and that's five to 10 grams per liter of the, the Thebane, which is a little downstream from there. So we're not far from there, um, but not, we're not quite there. One of the reasons we didn't push any farther is after reticulin, you end up in the controlled substance space. And uh, Health Canada doesn't like it when you start making 
grams per liter of controlled substances in your academic lab. So, so, so far we haven't been able to push the pathway too much, too much farther down. So I just want to talk a little bit more about the design build test uh, because it's, it's really central to speeding up what, what you do for, for, for these pathways. So standard parts and modularity is really important. And I'm just using this figure that I hijacked from a, a paper that kind of demonstrates that nicely. If you're only looking at a three gene pathway and you want to try three promoters for three genes on a three gene pathway, you're looking at 729 variants. And, you're, and that's not a lot of pathway space uh, in, in terms of what you can do, right? So, uh, so if you think you're going to do, so if you want to expand on that, I mean, it kind of goes exponential in terms of if you've got a longer pathway or you need to balance your intermediates uh, more and more, if you're going to go beyond that, you really need better tools than just an army of students in the lab. <clears throat> and you really need automation. And I'm kind of giving you, again, I hijacked this figure from this paper, this 2017 paper, but this nicely illustrates what this automation looks like. And automation is so much more than just uh, a bunch of robots moving plates around, although that's important to have. But any kind of genome foundry or automation process needs to have these really four components that everyone talks about, design, build, test, and learn cycle. When you talk about design, it, there's a different, the design's at different levels, right? When you, when you start thinking about this, you can think about DNA design, so codon optimization or, or variants of your promoter or things like that. You can think about pathway design, so just like I showed you in your previous slide, and then you can start talking about, whoops, you can start talking about network design, whether it's a metabolic network or regulatory network. So you move up in, in terms of scale and complexity. There's all sorts of tools, uh, computational tools that help you do that. That has to be part of your part of your uh, foundry pipeline. And then, of course, you need software to activate all these designs and build them. Learning, I'm not going to talk about much today, but there's some groups that are doing some really interesting stuff in this space, uh, testing, sorry. And then the learn is becoming more and more important. I'll talk about that for a second. So the learn is really, it speaks to what I was talking about before. If you start thinking about the complexity of the problem and how many combinations and permutations you have to build, you can't do this, right? So the idea around the learning, so it's basically using machine learning. I am not an expert in this space, uh, but there are certainly people in the field. And really what you have is you have uh, uh, your different strains that you're going to be building and all of the different inputs that you can have, whether it's metabolites, gene expression, whatever it is. And you can train uh, your, 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 your algorithm on this data set. And af afterwards, the, the, the machine learning process will actually allow you to uh, make predictions and, and validate your, your shots on goal. So it really allows you to go, instead of building thousands and thousands and thousands of things, you're probably better to build a few hundred, two, three, four hundred, learn something from it, and narrow your scope using using some machine learning. And actually allows you to really uh, make strain engineer outcomes more predictable and really reduce the scale of your DBTL engineering cycle. Or else you're just building too many things, most of which are not going to be useful anyways. Last few slides is really to pitch our foundry, um, because I hope some of you that are listening to this presentation will call us and come and work with us. It'd be a, a lot of fun. So this is a shot taken from the uh, the stairs coming down into the foundry. On the right, we have our mammalian uh, as, um, suite of the foundry. And on the right, we have what we call microbials, which so is microbial and DNA. <clears throat> so really what the foundry is, is a technology platform. And really our vision is to empower biological engineer to achieve the next scientific breakthrough. In other words, scale your experiment to get there. And what we do is we help you along and we have an end-to-end -end design construction testing and analysis. We're still working on the analysis, but the front end we have to really help groups, researchers, scientists, MSCs, what MSCs, SMEs, sorry, to achieve that goal. Quickly, so this is our one of our toys. Um, it was built by Thermo. Uh, it's called an Inspire. And what you really, the way you build these things is you actually think about, uh, as, a, as a scientist, you're sitting at the bench and you're building a plasma and you think about all the steps that need to go into the building a plasma, whether it's going to be liquid dispensing, thermocycling, PC, PCR, uh, fragment analysis, uh, dispensing buffers and reagents, it's all there. So right now the system is kind of exploded, it normally sits back in here. You have a spinnaker, which is a, ro a robotic arm with a, that spins on itself with an elbow. And it can reach all of these instruments. And you have a schedule that sits beside it. And you basically design your experiments on the computer. And, and off you go. You load all your parts and pieces and plasmas into your plate hotel. And, and you build things. 
<clears throat> I'm going to skip this. It basically just goes into a workflow of how this would, would go. You assemble your DNA, you transform, pick colonies, your PCR, et cetera, et cetera. And if you're building more and more complex things, then you just repeat this and build more complex plasmids. We have a fairly uh, involved uh, limbs, and this, this is something we built in-house. Unfortunately, we, we were hoping to have uh, off-the-shelf solutions for this, but it turns out that there, there's no such thing. So we're building databases with strain plasmids, fragments, all of those scripts to actually activate the robots, tracking the tracker samples. So this is all barcoded. Uh, and eventually we'll have the, the, the learning aspect part of our process. Just wanted to give you an example. We just built this uh, CRISPR array, so a CRISPR deletion array for, for uh, 384 targets. And so this just took us about 48 hours. But just to give you an idea of the number of transfers and, and pipetting and runtime and everything else, 21,624 transfers or uh, altogether with less than 48 robot time for success rate of 78% for construction of our plasmids. So we can do this. The important point is, in this case, we're just doing a 3D4 plate. Adding one plate, two plate, three plate, four plates on the deck is, is the same thing. It's just repeating the same thing. So you can scale that pretty fast. Uh, just one quick pitch. We also are getting into the uh, mammalian cell and more specifically stem cell engineering space as part of the foundry. So we have this uh, Vantage system. The Vantage is really a deck that allows you to manipulate plates and, and move media and transfer and passage cells. We have an imaging system at the bottom and a nuclear vector so the gripper arm can reach at the back and the bottom, take images, images and transfer cells. I have a video of that, but I'm going to skip it because um, I think we've been talking for too long. Um, so really, this is the idea. So we're working in this space right now where, you know, natural products and small molecules are, are an important, um, uh, or has a lot of value in our, in our pharmacy today. But we really see the pharmacy of the future being more engineered cells. Uh, and this is where we're slowly going. So that the, we like to call it the living pharmacy. Um, if you're interested in working with the foundry, um, contact Benjamin Scott. He's our advisor, business development partnership engagement. We work with just about everybody. Uh, but when we work with everybody, we work on different different scales. So we do have quite a few academic researchers. We work with a lot of SMEs, uh, startup companies, a little bit less with the larger big pharma, but some of them, and more and more with uh, people working in the stem cell research space. I want to conclude by, by citing this, which I hope, and probably a lot of people have read, a lot of, a lot of the audience here, this report that came out from McKenzie just last year in May 2020. And a couple of quotes directly from their documents uh, stating that as much as 60% of the physical inputs to the global economy could in principle be produced biologically. I think this is a, a huge shout out to sustainability. I, I think this is, we have no choice. We're going to have to go in this direction and biology is going to play a big role uh, in the way we, we, we do things in the future. And again, a quote from the same summary, biology has the potential in the future to determine what we eat what we wear, the products we put on our skin, and the way we build our physical world. And I totally agree with that as well. So, so in my opinion, and, and Mackenzie seems to share my opinion, <laughs> maybe it's the other way around. Uh, I think this is the space that we have to go uh, in, in both, as Steve mentioned at the beginning, in, in both agriculture and food and, and medicines, um, materials. This is, really, this is really the space to, to move into in the coming years. And I'm hoping Canada's going to get on top of that and get it going. So in my last slide, uh, really our mission here, my lab, and also the Foundry and the Genome Center, the, the Synthetic Biology Center, is to really build with biology for society's needs, whatever that would be. And on that, I think that was my last slide. Yes, it was. So I'm happy to answer any questions. I think I went Terrific. with it. Vincent, thank you. And... Uh... I know uh, I very much appreciated the talk and I liked seeing the pathways and I like seeing the structures because uh, chemistry is really important. <laughs> and I think one of the things that I think is really, uh, really important to emphasize is, and I know there's some questions in the Q&A on this already, is using nature's 
biodiverse using the diversity of nature as starting points is you know evolution is a good thing and it allows us to select and you mentioned you know we've only tapped a certain point a, a, a very a min, we've only scratched the surface of the diversity and um you know the challenge that uh in some ways, a lot of the industry stopped doing natural products work in the 90s and went for combinatorial chemistry was the solution to, to diversity. And for those organizations that maintained natural products capability, it's an integral part of the discovery strategy to introduce novelty and deliver new products, new modes of actions with better outcomes than, you know, some of the other chemical starting points could be. So I really liked the presentation. I also liked your shout out to the, we can do this from a, from a scientific curiosity basis, which would be micrograms per, 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 per milliliter, but we need to get to grams per milliliter for scale and the challenges there. I thought that was, very beneficial to to our to our crowd. First question that I want to mention goes back to the uh, the biodiversity. How important do you think the um, in depth characterization of plant and uh, microbial diversity is? It would be required to kind of underpin the further. I'm going to use the word exploitation, and that's the wrong word, but to to accelerate not new bioactive drugs like the ones that you highlighted artemis and then uh, taxol and examples like that a real benefit both from a human health perspective but as you mentioned all other areas how much how important is that in-depth characterization I, I i actually think it's it's very important i have i have a dream you know so you, you look at the databases and you're certain mining the databases of people that sequence plant transcriptome and their and their and their gold mines, right? You, you'll find all this diversity in terms of enzymes sequences, which hopefully relate to enzyme function. And uh, and we did some of that. I, I didn't want to get too deep into the nuts and bolts, but we did that for for some classes of enzyme methyl transferases and P450s, where we just synthesized a couple of hundred genes and we threw them at the at our pathways, and we saw a plethora, like a just used diversity in terms of how active the enzymes were in our yeast and then what types of reactions they would do. So you would feed it a precursor and certain enzymes would do this, other enzymes would do that. So all of a sudden you have that combinatorial biochemistry is talking about, it's there, but you need to be able to access that diversity. But again, automation and robotics, and for anyone that knows Ginkgo, that's that's a big part of their, their success is they have this databases of lots and lots and lots of genes that have been characterized to a certain extent. That helps them bring that diversity into their into their engineering um, processes. So yeah, very. And the supplemental question from the same the same participant was: Do we need an Earth biogenome approach to sequence everything, or can we just pick and choose? That example you gave of you know the database and tapping that diversity. Yeah. It, it, I mean, one of the you know one of the things that I think was interesting about your comment. Vincent, is you were able to tap the genome and you picked diversity. I think one of the things that personally, I shouldn't answer the question, I should leave it to you, is that we tend to outsmart ourselves. Right. But that's my opinion. Yeah. And and so an earth bio, how did you call it? A bio, earth bio genome? Um, yes. That, and I hope that, I hope the individuals trademarked that because that was pretty cool. <laughs> um. I think we have to do a lot better job at mining the the biogenome. Now, whether we have to bio mine everything, so one of the things that we do see is 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 we do see a lot of re redundancy or some redundancy. Um, so I think if we're smart about it, we can probably sample a lot of the biogenome that give us a lot of diversity without sequencing everything. Uh, but you know, you, you can see. I mean, this is. If we did that, it would be really frustrating for me because I would see the 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 the, uh, the availability of all that. 
all the toys in the, in the cupboard that I can't play with. <laughs> so there's enough toys in there right now that I can barely scratch that surface. If you provide me more toy, I, I might lose my mind. Okay, well, okay, but that's not our intention is to make you go insane. But I do think the comment you made about redundancy is is really important because in you know in traditional natural product discovery efforts it's diversity has been driven either at the species level or the geographic location and mm -hmm. you know the funny thing about um the funny thing about evolution it's both divergent and convergent and that ability that redundancy challenge is something that again needs to be addressed i also really liked in your talk about the application of you know design of experiment to do the incomplete uh multifactorial experiment to to learn where the hot spots are to make improvements on on your uh on on, on your pathway and again i think those examples were wonderful one question uh that came up from another another sp uh participant was is you know yeast your primary chassis Mm -hmm. Or do you or do you work with other microbes as well? Um, we have a few other projects. Um, so we're we, we're working more and more with what we call non-conventional yeasts, so non uh, non Saccharomyces. Um, there's a trade-off there, right? And we choose them because they have um, some natural phenotype that's beneficial to us. But then we have to do. Uh, at the front end, there's a lot of work to, to, to make them, let's say, haploids or to build genetic tools, although CRISPR has been a boon um, for, for us. It seems like everything's CRISPRable. I don't know if that's a word or not, but... Uh, or is today, Vincent. <laughs> organisms that you couldn't fathom doing, you know, gene deletions and gene integrations in not so long ago. We, we're doing it today. Um, so, yeah, non-conventional um, yeast strains, we have... A few projects with algae, but uh, our workhorse is really right now Saccharomyces. Um, but what what are hope? So as you build, and this is this is an interesting point. As you as you start engineering, and building things in these in these other organisms, you realize I think it really shines a big spotlight on our limitation. Um, and you go, okay, so now I better understand the limitation of this host. Uh, what host would uh, unshackle me from these limitations? So. So there's a lot, and in, in the process, you learn quite a bit about about the biology. I get faulted all the time for for doing too much of a applied research, but you wouldn't believe how much basic science we discover as we try to apply research. I do apply research. An example is that one slide where I showed the design uh, build cycle. A lot of these knockouts that we found, no one had any idea they were involved in in redox of aldehydes and yeast. So as you're trying to make this aldehyde, and you're and you're banging on the host to do that, you're discovering all sorts of interesting uh, biological uh, activities that weren't known before. So, so learning. Yeah, I think I, when you when you use that example, I've heard it described the on pathway changes are in the light yeah. and the host path, the, the host changes are in the dark, so to speak and and very enlightening and again that comment about applied research or research versus uh i don't know what the other pure research i think that is that is a i'll be you know an editorial comment for me i think it gets in the way of mm -hmm. us really innovating because like you said those those discoveries are huge in terms of gene function that we had no idea what they did so that's that's i think congratulations another question Back to the, back to the chemistry because I like it and it was not. This is not from me. Um, again, back to the idea of being able to look at structure activity uh, relationship sets. Um, you showed examples of feeding different precursor inputs leading to different final products or using different um, auxiliary enzymes in the pathway outside of the core to create. Uh, different final products or diverse series of chemistry. How well established is this for the production using native hosts or for heterologous hosts? So how is how is established to produce these non-natural products or non-natural? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I think 
a lot of it is, I wouldn't say is new. Um, it's kind of a difficult space to explore because uh, unless you can make, so if you, an example I gave, unless you can make that one precursor uh, in a recombinant way, then it's difficult to explore the, the common material biochemistry around that molecule. So you first have to establish making your amine and making your aldehyde and, and making your, you know, expressing your, your, your copper and synthase. And only then can you start exploring that diversity. And it, it's really limited to different things like how that synthase will accept the different, the different precursors. So we're, we're just really at, at, at the beginning of this and, 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 and what we find, so two things, what we find is uh, certain classes of enzymes seem to be a lot more promiscuous and allow you to really branch out and open up opportunities and creating diversities and others seem to be really set in their ways. Um, okay. So they're more difficult to do. But also speaking to bioactivity, I didn't want to bring this uh, into this into this presentation, but one of the things that we started doing and we just published a, or put out a, a preprint on BioArchive on this is uh, started expressing uh, G-couple protein receptors uh, in, in yeast. And we're actually using, they're actually function, uh, functional in yeast, some of the ones that we're using. So we actually express the new uh, opioid receptors. Actually, all the opioid receptors we express in yeast and they're all functional. So now that gives us a tool, um, a kind of a biosensor tool around around this uh, the receptors, the natural receptors through these analgesics right. to explore bioactivity around this space. Um, so yeah, yeah, I think, totally yeah, I think there's another, there's a couple questions related to the, the productivity questions about going from, you know, plants into microbes or yeast. Now there's a question about whether or not products from this technology will be a reality will depend on the cost of goods, which our ability to, to scale, you were pretty clear that that's a, that those are challenges and any, any thoughts on cost competitive of the bioreactor approach versus engineering plants themselves to be as factories for high value products? That's a good question. I think you'd probably be better uh, uh, to, ha to handle that question. The, the, from what I heard is the certification process for the plants that gets really, really complicated and difficult and costly. So correct me if I'm wrong. I haven't had that. No, before. it's 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 the timelines on engineered plants are way longer from just even the design, build, test, learn, the ability yeah. to multiply, and then from a regulatory perspective, there are ways to mitigate the deregulation because for many of these biologically actives, you'd never deregulate them. They have to be grown in the controlled and you know either in a greenhouse or some other isolated way so that you can get around it that way. But it's, it's again, I think it's, it, it becomes more, the beauty of a stir tank reactor is it's, it's, it's in a tank and you can kill it. Right. So, and you can control it. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the, I think the question is a good one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there, there's a, there's some really interesting articles that came out on, for example, on Artemis and in project, and you can probably do, you know, back of the envelope calculation on the opioid stuff as well, where, you know, when, when we started the Artemis and project, we had a certain titers and yields in mind. But as we're doing this, you know, the plant people are not sitting on their hands. So they're cranking up on, on all sorts of different ways to get the numbers up in, in the plant as well. And and initially it was like, oh, you know, as, as a micro engineering, oh, this is not so good. But if you're, let's say, Bill Gates sitting on the other side, that's perfect. Right? I mean, at the end of the day, you don't really care if you're making it from the plant or the microbe, as long as you're producing it and lowering the costs and making more efficient processes. Who cares if the plant or the microbe works? So there's this kind of challenge in this game going back and forth in terms of in terms of yields for the plant and the microbe for a while. And, 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 I, and I do think that even with what you showed as the, the platform, the, the entire build side, the design and build side is you know, kind of independent of the host. Because right. if you are making, if you're making uh, gene editing tools for a plant host or a yeast or or what you still have to go through and your your platform is agnostic in that aspect for, for the endpoint. The other, the other question, which is again, kind of the in between the 
the whole plant and the microbial system is the idea of, have you ever worked with plant cells in culture? I have not, no. <laughs> have not. We're, we're working with uh, uh, iPS cells right now, and that's hard enough as it is. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, no, not plant cells, but come back to your previous point. It, what you just described is exactly what we're doing on that side. So on, on the DNA build side, we're, we're building crisp, large CRISPR arrays. Right. So, so someone will say like, look, I want to address, you know, whatever pathways in my, in my, in my HEC or HeLa or whatever cell line, I need these 500 CRISPR uh, tools or whatever. We can, we can build that. You saw that. That was just one example. We can build that in two days. And, and the problem then the challenge is introducing that into your cell lines and phenotyping them. That's a, that's a different issue, but yeah. So we have, we're onboarding several projects right now and just building CRISPR arrays for, for CRISPR screening. Excellent. One other, one other question was, uh, again, back to the, the entire pathway and engineering the entire pathway in a host. One of the questions from the audience was, have you thought about modularizing it? So making a, um, using, uh, you know, building to this point in one strain, building to the next point in the next, or the components and then assembling it synthetically. Any thoughts on that idea? Yeah, there's a, there's a there's a camp that believes that that's the way to go, and and a lot of it has to do with resource allocation for the cell and, and things of that nature. As I said, you know, by the time we reach the end, our our, our yeast is limping. Uh, it's just doing it, but I don't think it likes doing it. Um, so that's a possibility. The issue that you run into here is transport, um, and I, this is something we still haven't gotten a really good grip on. Is some of these natural products, the yeast will spit out, no problem, and others not. And, and I believe it has everything to do with some of the drug efflux pumps or, or some of the other transporters that, that have some specificity. Uh, and it's hard to determine what that specificity is. So sometimes in the middle of a pathway, it'll start pumping out an intermediate and you're like, what's going on here? So it might be a charge, it might be who knows what it is. So, But if you're going to break away a pathway between three or four different organisms and the metabolite has to go out of one and into the next one and out of it and into the next one. So, so you, you could ostensibly, and then of course, once you get into the cellular milieu or the culture medium, you get other problems, right? So we, we see with pH, we get redox problems with some intermediates or media turns black or brown and because dopamine will oxidize or something like that. So there's a lot of other intrinsic factors in there that makes the process a little bit more complicated. Um, yeah, I, I think it's a, it's an approach, but I, and then in addition to the technical issues, I also wonder about the regulatory issues related to how do you declare a, cell, a master cell line or production cell line and, and everything else. So again, I think uh, I think I think it's an interesting approach, but that's one of the beauties of the regulated world that we live in is needing to think about the endpoint. Right. Our next speaker, Jorg Bullman, just sent me a note saying reminding me that taxol production is using plant cells. So again, I think, uh, thanks, thanks, Jorg. And uh, yeah. again, I think they're very, I think we need to look at all the kind of hosts and opportunities and your group working in uh, microbial systems, yeast, bacteria, and in the, in the mammalians, the human side, the mammalian side is, is, that's a big, that's a big job. I also, Appreciate you showing your identifying a key gap that we have here in Canada related to that translation from the bench to the yeah. to a, not not to necessarily to a pilot, but something that is more predictable of scalability to the kinds of volumes we need. Hey, um, I I've had a lot of fun, Vincent. Thank you for for uh, this could go on for hours and hours. Yeah. Please. And, and uh, again, I want to put a plug in for uh, next week. We've got Dr. Jorg Bowman speaking, and he's going to be giving an example again of, 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 of sources of diversity, chemical diversity from natural source, like from plants in this case, and having new solutions for diseases that we've been wrestling with for a long time and a disease that Canada through Banting and Best and Collip and McLeod led the charge on in terms of being able to manage it, but not 
uh, cure. So new ideas around uh, metabolic diseases that York will be talking about next week. So thank you, Vincent. And thanks everybody for, for participating in today's call. Most appreciated. It was a lot of fun. Thanks everyone. Uh, I'm going to put in to, to listen to, to, to your, I guess in the month, is it? or York is next week. Week. Oh, okay. Yeah, next week, the All 13th. Right. I'm sure Take it's care. Good.